love, say it out loud, love. This is really weak. Let's try it again. You repeat after me. Let me be clear. Love, love. sex, sex. Dating. dating. Let's do it again. Let's just say love. love. Let's shout sex. sex. Let's whisper dating. Okay. It's the only place you could ever shout sex and we're in church. It's really kind of a different kind of a deal. All right. Guys. We are, talk, uh, we are tackling our LSD series, Love, Sex, and Dating, starts tonight, and we're going to be real with you. We're going to talk about what happens in relationships. We're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. We're going to talk about what God's Word has to say about this. We're going to hit some different angles that I think are going to really hit close to home for a lot of you, okay? And we're kicking it off tonight in grand style because we have one of our own who is so beloved, who is going to come and share part of her story and a bit of God's word with you tonight before we go to groups. I want you to give your undivided attention and an incredible welcome to our own Kendall Phillips. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so if we haven't met yet, I'm Kendall Phillips. I am the 11th grade girls leader here, and um, my husband and I, Cameron, the ninth grade boys leader. We've been coming to Low Country for almost four years now. But um, I want to open us in prayer real quick before we dive right in. So bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so very much. Um, just for every student that is in this room, God, I just pray that we would have receptive hearts tonight um, that are just open to your word and your truth. And God, I just pray that you would use me as a vessel, um, that you would speak through me or in spite of me, and that God... Um, that your message would be heard. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Awesome. So like Pastor Rob said, we are tackling a huge series. And tonight there's going to be a few big questions that um, you'll get to talk more about in your groups. So if you could, just give me your attention for about 20 minutes. And um, they all center around one main topic, which Rob had you all scream, sex, right? And uh, the questions we're going to tackle is, what is sex intended for? Um, why should you save yourself for marriage? Like, really, why should you? And what is God's view of all of this, and where do you go from it? Um, so, Gabe, if you want to pull up the first slide, this is a billboard that Cameron and I actually drove by while we were home in Texas. And it's a real billboard in Houston and this is the actual dentist, and it says, I make sexy teeth. And the thing that creeps me out about this most is that he's not even showing his own teeth, right? And I don't think I know anyone that has walked into the dentist and said, yes, I need these to be sexy. Um, I think most people ask for, like, I want less pain in my mouth, or I just want them to be a little bit straighter. Maybe they want them a little bit wider. And in reality, a lot of us walk out of the dentist looking like this. <laughs> And um, this is just one of the ways that society has really tried to sell sex. And um, Katy Perry is doing a great job of representing that for me, that teeth were never meant to be sexy. So we're going to hop into our first question. What is sex intended for? And um, like I said, society would have us believe that it's something to do with whoever you want that um, it's something that everyone is already doing and that if you're not doing it, you're missing out. So how many of y'all actually kept up with like The Bachelor this season? Did anyone watch that? Some of the girls in here? Oh, some guys too. Now, I don't know how many of y'all heard about this, but the whole controversy was that this guy Colton was a virgin at 26 and oh my gosh, that's so weird. How could he still be a virgin? He must be super weird if girls don't like him. Like, how could this be? And they just went on and on about it. And they made it seem like it was something bad, when in reality, that's not the way it should have been at all. So we're going to look at what God actually has to say about it. Um, so God created sex before the fall of mankind ever happened, right? Right? He created Adam and Eve and literally told them, be fruitful and multiply. Basically setting the tone, setting the mood, telling them, go off, make babies, right? And he never intended for it to be something used to hurt us. So Gabe, if you'll put up Genesis 2, 24. It says, therefore, 
A man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So here we see Adam and Eve. They've got this free will to go off and do whatever they want, and they're completely naked, and they're not ashamed. And that's going to be a big key in our story. So God made sex to be enjoyed. And if you don't believe me, if you think this is something you've never heard in church, just go and open your Bibles to the book of Solomon. And Rob's talked about this before. It talks about shaking some palm trees and um, some pretty explicit stuff. But in Proverbs, um, Solomon even references, he says, let your wife fill you at all times with delight and be intoxicated always with her love. So we see that God is the great creator of sex, and he wants it to be enjoyed. He wants you to have it and have babies. And um, he made it to where it was so enjoyable and so life-giving that literally it's the way that new life is formed. It's the way that he chose for humans to continue on his creation, and it brings miracles into this world every single day. So... Maybe right now you're thinking, well, Kendall, if it's so great, why should I wait, right? So that's going to be question number two that we're going to tackle. Why should you wait, really? And um, growing up, I had always heard true love waits. How many of y'all have heard that? Yeah, most of you guys. So I had heard true love waits or virginity is a gift to give your spouse or you just, you don't do it. You just practice abstinence, right? And I grew up, some of y'all heard my testimony last year, in a family that was never really involved in church. Um, I had grandparents who went, but my parents never took me. And they actually kind of discouraged it. And I didn't start going to church until I was 16. And at 15, I had no clue what sin was. I didn't really care about sin because I didn't know what it was. And I had never really been taught or shown by my family that sex was something intended for after marriage. And um, at 15, you know, I was convinced that I was already in true love. I was convinced that I had already found the man I was going to marry because we had dated for like a year. And in teenage years, that's like a really long time, right, to be dating someone. And... Um, I just knew that we were both madly in love, right? We were each other's first boyfriend and girlfriend and all the yucky, mushy stuff. And so I had sex before I ever knew what it was intended for. And spoiler alert, I didn't marry that guy. So this left me with a really deep heartache. And if y'all hang on just for a second. So it left me with a deep heartache that I would carry um, with me for a really long time. And Afterwards, I felt ashamed, I felt wrong, and I felt like if I ever found a Christian man that I wasn't worthy to be with him or that somehow I would be loved less or I was less valuable in some way. And so here's what I wish someone would have told me before this had ever happened, right? Um, God's parameters, not just for sex, but the rules and words to live by that he lays out in the Bible are not, um, are not laid out for us to feel confined, but they're actually the way that we can find the maximum amount of joy with the minimum amount of pain. So God's parameters for us to live by are the way that we can find the maximum amount of joy and the minimum amount of pain. You see, we find our most joy and our true joy when we live in communion with our creator. And... That minimum amount of pain comes from knowing that when you accept Christ, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that you can ever do that will separate you from God. So you have this thing that brings you joy, and you have the safety net of knowing you're never going to lose that thing that brings you joy. Do you all see that? Yeah. So he never intended for two people to be this physically intimate outside of the safety of a covenant. And here's why. So in 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, 
but the sexual immoral person commits a sin against his own body. And it's true. There was never a time that I had sex outside of marriage where deep down I didn't leave feeling used and abused, even though it would be with this man that I trusted or that I thought I really loved and that loved me. And this sin would actually draw me away from God's truth and it drew me away from God's word. And I was re literally removing myself from God's presence, the place where we find our most joy. And I could feel that pain and it made that heartache so great. You see, we are literally at our most vulnerable time when we stand in front of someone completely naked. And whether that's emotionally or physically, that person gets to see all of our flaws, all of our insecurities, they're all on display, right? This is where the beauty of the covenant comes in. In a covenant with your spouse, they look at you and they vow that they're gonna love you in sickness and in health um, through every flaw and every mistake, all the ups and downs and all the weight gain before you ever have to put yourself in that vulnerable place. They commit to be locked in for life. And hear me when I say this, in a covenant, you get to stand in front of someone and be completely vulnerable and completely safe. You never have to have that feeling of being used. You don't ever have to have that fear of being heartbroken again. And just like our covenant with God, who knows the deepest parts of our hearts, and he knows, you know, the things that we hate the most about us, he still loves us. And that's what you receive when you're in a covenant with your spouse. You have someone who knows you better than you know yourself sometimes, and they still say, I love you and I choose you every day. So, question three. What is God's view in all of this? Um, we learn that God's grace covers all sin. So in John 1.16, it says, Indeed, we have all received grace upon grace. And this is something I want you to understand the weight of. So the wages of any sin is death, right? I think that's something we've all learned. And we've learned that the blood of Christ covers all sin. And at 16, I got to receive the free, unearned, unmerited favor of God. I got to receive God's grace. And not only was it grace for that moment, but literally... God told me that I am giving you grace for all the sins you've committed in your past. I'm giving you grace for all the sins that you committed today. And I'm going to give you grace for all the sins that you commit in the future. Literally, grace upon grace. And now, not only does God grant us this grace and this eternal life with him and his communion and his Holy Spirit, but he even gave me a godly husband, something I never thought that I would have. And not only did he give me a godly husband, but he gave me a great marriage. And it's one that I absolutely love. And I think that's so cool. So I have this godly husband and a great marriage. And on top of it, he's even really cute. And I just think that's awesome. Like, not only do I get this thing that I didn't think that I deserved, but I also get a cute husband, which I get to enjoy. Like, that's awesome. So, um, it's literally grace upon grace, and it's unearned, it's unmerited, and it's something that is open and extended to everyone. You just have to receive it. So, God calls us to sanctification. This is no matter where you're starting from, no matter what your past mistakes have been or not been. If you have received this Holy Spirit, this is what you need to hear. In 1 Thessalonians 4.3, it says, for this is God's will, your sanctification, that you keep away from sexual immorality, that each of you knows how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with lustful passions like the Gentiles who don't know God. For God has called us not to impurity, but to holiness. And consequently, 
anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So think about this. God has given us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us. And when we sin, sin and holiness does not mix. It's like oil and water. And when we sin against ourselves, we're sinning against the literal Holy Spirit that's inside of us. And you can feel that. You can feel that being torn away. And it's never going to be too far from you. That's not what I mean when I say that. But you can feel that pain because the two don't mix. So God's not saying that we have to be perfect. Sanctification does not equal perfection, and we don't have to have shame or guilt for what we've done in the past. But he's asking us to be set apart, to not look like the Gentiles, or we can replace that with the rest of society. We're supposed to look weird, and we're supposed to look different, and we're supposed to do things in a way that makes people say, why do you do that? So we're supposed to take this knowledge that he's given us, this word that he's given us to live by, and to walk in his truth. And like I said earlier, it's not to limit us, and he's not trying to set you up for failure. He's trying to protect you and allow you to enjoy life to the fullest. If temptation is something that you know you're already struggling with tonight, I want to encourage you to find accountability partners. Find someone in this small group when we break up and say, hey, I need you because I know that tonight's message was meant for me. And there's going to be times in my future when I struggle and I need someone to call. And I encourage you to reach out to someone and just the first thing is to tell them, this is something I struggle with. Um, the next thing that you can do is to set clear boundary lines. So if you know that after a certain time, your temptation like soars, after that time, say, you know what, to your boyfriend or girlfriend, we're going to stop hanging out at 10 p.m. Or if we hang out after 10 p.m., it has to be in a group setting. We can't be alone because I know I'm going to be tempted. And last but not least, turn to God. God is going to be your ultimate um, protector and provider. And Psalms 119.9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word. So turn to God and his word, and he will provide for you, and he will help you. My last point is going to be this, that our purity comes from God and him alone. We know that we have all fallen short of his glory, that we have all sinned, and that all sins are weighted the same. So I encourage you to seek his ways, to find your joy in him, and to remember that a label doesn't define you. Whether you're a virgin or not a virgin doesn't make you pure or not pure. You see, you can physically be a virgin and not have a pure heart. And God can make your heart pure even if you're not a virgin. So I'm going to close in prayer. Bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for tonight and just this opportunity to dive into your word. And God, thank you for just the ability to get to speak into some of the hearts of these students tonight. And Lord, I just pray that if this is a temptation that someone is struggling with and they hear this message, God, that you would just place your hand on their back and just let them know that you are near to them, that you are there to comfort them and that they can seek you out anytime that they need you. God, I just pray that these students wouldn't just hear this word and leave here the same way they walked in, but God, that you would take this word and light it in their hearts, that they would have to go and share it and spread it and use it in their everyday walk. God, you are so beautiful and you created this master plan where we get to have the most amount of joy and the least amount of pain. And I just pray that tonight that someone in this room who needed to hear this message sees that and understands that they no longer have to walk in shame or guilt. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us and for his blood that covers all our sins. It's in your name I pray, amen.